while I think there's efforts, there's still uh, room for, for more for more work on that issue. And, and is there any way to identify the source of this? I mean, is it, is it individuals? Is it individual voters? Is it uh, the cruise ships? I and mean, what, what contributes the most to the trash that we see in Tampa Bay or in the Gulf? Well, there is some ways to find sources, and it depends on the type of debris. We've got some guys here from Florida Fish and Wildlife uh, Commission that work on derelict vessels, for instance. Yep, right here in the front row. And, you know, they are able to sometimes, re, you know, learn who it was responsible for a for a derelict vessel or an abandoned vessel in the state of Florida. Um, also, the trap fisheries, like lot, the commercial fishing industry has tagged gear, so it's easy to trace at least the pots back to the the fishermen. Um, but some of the other consumer debris, monofilament, um, so recreational fisheries, it's really difficult to tie back to an individual. But I can say, you know, as population grows in the state, which you guys probably all know in Florida, the population continues to grow. There's there's more and more people utilizing the resource and more important people um, fishing. So um, not necessarily a, a bad problem, but it's a, a continuous issue of making sure that people are educated on the issue. Uh, and do you guys have anything to add to that question about the source or uh and you want it? Uh, no, just the, the source of where this, uh, the trash is coming from. A little bit from everywhere. A little bit from everywhere. Yeah. We even heard stories today of um, international sources. What, what about, um, uh, in terms of the, of the marine animals interacting, the fish interacting, the, 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 uh, the birds interacting, how do they treat this stuff when, when they come across it? Well, entanglement is definitely an issue, um, primarily with um, what we heard a lot today in presentations um, from the Audubon Society. So we had um, Mark Rochelle from the Audubon Society give a presentation about entanglement with birds. And oftentimes, um, it's hard for us to distinguish between like actively fishing, um, because oftentimes animals encounter active fishing and get entangled at that point. But then it, they can take that, especially birds, since they can fly, they can take that back to their, their nest where they um, roost. And that's what we heard about today, which was actually new information for me. And you know, then you have a series of entanglements that it can occur at the roosting site. So that was, that was interesting to learn today. Um, other wildlife impacts, um, we have a number of people working on with protected species, particularly sea turtles, um, the dolphins, and the manatee. Um, they often, um, I, I can't remember the, the percentage, and I don't know if Kim thinks this hole is here, but there was some percentage of, of all strandings related to um, the strandings that they have, have count, um, counted related to debris encounters. So, so they've done the microscopies on, on the stranded animals? Right. So there's there's a really well-developed stranding network in the state of Florida and a lot of states and across the U.S. And um, they collect data on all these animals that come in for whatever reason. And um, they uh, a, a study that was just recently published um, this year looked at entanglement for the state of Florida. And um, it was gear on. So basically when they found an animal that was um, stranded that had actual debris on them. So, and you know, I, I do want to draw a distinction be between sometimes we don't know if that gear was after it became debris or if it was actively fishing gear. So that is one of the caveats that we, we know that some of the dolphins have behaviors that attract them to fishing, fishermen. So um, sometimes this isn't actually debris. It's it's more um, educating fishermen and um, learning about how how they interact with that. And Kim, when you say gear on, what what, what kind of gear are we talking about? Talk about mostly. I think they see from from what we heard today. Um, mostly, we're are, it's either lines 
of some sort. So monofilament is a is a is a bad one, um, and then other types of fishing line um, line from from like lobster trap buoy lines or crab lines um, that can that can uh, entangle animals and. Um, I believe there's probably some also fishing nets. So mostly. It's not lures or anything. Well, I think they have found certain animals that have lures, and, and I think that that's that distinction between the active fishing gear. It's usually, um, you know, dolphins <coughs> eat the same type of fish that we like to eat. So when, you know, people are fishing on piers and fishing boats, they're attracted to that. So um, that's, you know, not something our program really deals with because that's not debris at that point. It's more of a, a fisherman and wildlife um, in, encounter. So, uh, Howie, you had your hand up. You want to ask the first question? I, I was just thinking from the standpoint, of it, I think you've almost answered it, and that is, it would strike me, unless I'm being naive, that the line, fishing line is cheap. It's the type of stuff you cut off if, it's, if it gets tangled or something's going on. The, it would strike me that the commercial fishermen wouldn't want to cut loose a, a trap or a net because that's not cheap stuff. That yeah. if they do it, it's because it was an accident or someone happened to hit, dolphin happened to hit the line and broke it. Yeah, I, we heard some presentations today, and actually we have some folks that have done an extensive amount of research um, with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission. And most of the traps are lost due to what they believe is, and Gabby's right there, um, to prop cuts from recreational boaters that come through. And you're exactly right. These guys, these traps are valuable to them, not, not only in terms of the value that they've invested in the trap itself, but in the the, the catch. So they definitely have a vested interest in making sure that they don't lose their traps, and they are very involved in some mitigation and um, removal of these as well. So it's educating the recreational fishermen and the recreational owners. And then another thing, I mean, there's some things that you just can't predict. You know, sometimes you get a cold front coming around. That's that's what we heard today, um, and you know they they lose their their floats, and then once the float is lost, it's really difficult. The, the you know, I know, and I know we've got a lot of experts in the audience. So Gabby, or if anybody else wants to just jump in and add anything to, to what's being said up here, feel free. Uh, oh, she's uh, spot on. Okay, all right. <laughs> so, <laughs> how, how long does it take for monofilament line to break down in these parts? Anyone? I, I don't know that one. Does anybody know that? It's a long time. Over 50 years. Over 50 years. Right there. Darren, over there, over 50 years. I, I don't suppose that they could make monofilament line that would break down in just a few months. It just, it, that wouldn't, people wouldn't buy it. People wouldn't buy it. <laughs> it, wouldn't buy it. <laughs> it might not, it might not be a good question. <laughs> <I'm not sure. laughs> but Mike, let's go to you for a second. We live in this beautiful area. Um, talk about what your department is doing to protect our environment and to make sure that Waste is collected. That that the uh, that the Gulf and, and the Bay is protected. What what kind of things do you engage in? Or what can you talk about on that score? Well, first, thanks for having me. Uh, first time at one of these events, and I can just peer out and notice both the eccentric and the eclectic group that is here. Because <laughs> you have to share with me last year's uh, subject matter. Kind of got me a little scared and not much scared of him. Now, which subject matter are you talking about? Oh, oh, yes. the organism. Oh, oh the or organism. organism. You guys the miss organism. the organism. Yeah, I miss that. <laughs> and in, in any event, uh, Mayor Kreisman has also asked me to function as his sustainability director, in addition to public works administration, due large to the uh, amount of programs and projects that are directly affiliated with the city's sustainability initiatives, which generally are nothing more than the overlap of environmental benefits and social benefits and economic improvement. Specifically to the question at hand, uh, this is the greatest example of macro and micro I've ever talked about. Macro being the Gulf of Mexico, micro being 
this community in St. Petersburg, consisting of 62 square miles and 260 miles of coastline that is bordered by Boca Ciega Bay and Campo Bay, which are essentially an estuary environment, which is defined as a confluence of, of, of freshwater discharges to saltwater, functions as a nursery. It's extraordinarily important the habitat and the uh, living resources in our bay and ultimately to our Gulf. St. Pete's source of debris into Camp and Boca Ciega Bays are twofold. Uh, primarily from litter that may get into stormwater runoff, that may carry through sewer storm sewer pipes or ditches into our surface waters. And then uh, secondly, uh, uh, what, what may come from our sewage plants. Now, the city was blessed with very forward-thinking forefathers in as much as we have zero discharge into our surrounding surface waters from our treated wastewater. So we have four wastewater treatment plants, soon to be three, because we're decommissioning our most vulnerable plant at Alvaldwood Airport and pumping that sewage down to the southwest plant by Acre College. But all those plants have what they call modified secondary treatment that discharge into 12 different injection wells at the four treatment plant sites, which uh, discharge the wastewater about 1,000 foot below grade, way below the drinking water aquifer, and is separated by a layer of clay called the Hawthorne layer from a geological standpoint. So essentially, we avoid any discharge of debris and excessive nutrients intrinsic with wastewater and treated wastewater. So our primary source is stormwater. We have 26 different drainage basins in the city of St. Pete, 640 different outfalls, and about 80 miles of drainage ditch. And to abate the amount of litter that may enter these stormwater outfalls, we have a number of both educational means and mechanisms and mechanical means and mechanisms and management means and mechanisms. Uh, mechanical. We have installed about 65 different backflow prevention devices to abate high tide events entering our low-lying streets up in areas such as Shore Acres, Grey Bear Bay, Snell Island, etc. At the front end of these backflow prevention devices are trash racks and sediment sumps. The trash racks capture what might be anything from a softball to a can of beer to a styrofoam cup that gets deposited into the front yard or gutter line that ultimately reaches our drainage system. Maintenance crews then schedule uh, on an ongoing basis removal of that matter before it gets out into the bay. Uh, Booker Creek, which is the largest singular drainage basin in the city of St. Pete, in excess of 3,300 acres, that drains areas as north as 30th Avenue North, all the way down through Tropicana Field, through Rosa Park, and out ultimately into Bay Pearl Harbor. We have a boom, a floating boom, that crosses that creek before it gets into Bay Pearl Harbor. And we worked out a program with the estuary, that Tampa Bay estuary program, where they remove the debris that typically is caught uh, upstream of that boom during high tide rain events that cause the water to discharge in that direction. Uh, we have a number, number of other booms along other major ditch systems, not the least of which is Tinney Creek up in the Sunset Cove area, uh, in addition to the Admiral Farragut Basin that goes down to uh, discharges in the Boca Ciega Bay. Uh, we have in excess of 15,000 catch basins. Uh, at most of the intersections of city streets, you'll see these devices that collect stormwater that runs down from the gutter line into what's called an inland basin. And we have several factors, which are mechanical cleaning devices that essentially suck up the debris that's captured in those inland basins before it gets to a pipe that ultimately reaches the bay. We have 65 members of our stormwater maintenance division that are dedicated for that service and others, as it may relate to ditch mowing, uh, catch basin cleaning, line cleaning, et cetera, et cetera. So, there's a number of engineered devices in place, there are a number of managerial devices in place to abate the litter, and there uh, is inherently the fact that we enjoy a very 
prestigious and beautiful waterfront that is the envy of many communities across this country, but is well protected and well considered by our constituency. And considered in, in regard to uh, litter. Uh, very few populations of big cities across this country can brag about how litter conscientious they are as much as St. Petersburg residents can. Uh, rarely will you see something as, as, as much as a cigarette box deposited in our waterfront areas. So we have developed very high conscientiousness and an educational program of how to keep litter out of our surface waters. And I think our, uh, our populace has, uh, has been very appreciative and respectful of, of that benefit game. Clean uh, Marina, we talked about monofilament line. Uh, something as simple as providing a trash receptacle for excess monofilament associated with that fishery at the end of the St. Pete Pier is so basic and so easy to do that it's often overlooked, unfortunately. Uh, part of our Clean Marina program does involve those type of receptacles in addition to pump out stations where we have a mobile vessel that can go to each and every one of the live-in boat, live aboard boats and remove the sanitary sewage before it may escape uh, unpredictably into uh, the bay water. So uh, we brag about our clean marina program for no other reason than we have one of the largest publicly owned and operated marinas in the state of Florida. So uh, educational is also complemented through a collaborative effort we have with the uh, Tampa Bay Estuary Program. The Estuary Program has identified the living resource of seagrass as the barometer to the healthiness of the bay water quality. And it has steadfastly promoted projects that reduce nutrients going into the bay that promote algae blooms and reduction of oxygen and ultimately a less clear water body or surface water that inhibits the penetration of light to these seagrasses. So the more seagrass acreage we have, the cleaner our water is. The cleaner our water is, the better our fisheries are. And Tampa Bay Estuary Program's uh, leadership has led to a significant increase in seagrass acreage uh, throughout Tampa Bay. A lot of it's associated with Middle Tampa Bay, of which St. Pete drank directly into. We have regional stormwater treatment systems that treat uh, as much as uh, 2,800 acres of runoff entering Lake Magori that ultimately discharges into Salt Creek and down into the Salt Creek Marine District, all the way up to Mirror Lake, where there's a couple hundred acres of uh, pre-treated stormwater that enters Mirror Lake before it then uh, meanders and conveys itself into the Noy Basin. So it's really a matter of engineering, ongoing maintenance, management, and above all, the most cost-effective way to keep the debris out of your waterways is education. So. Well, that's, that's really complete there, Mike. How many times? Any idea how many tons of stuff you pull out from these uh, trash racks or from the boom? Uh, every yeah, year? It's uh, several thousand tons of material removed from these uh, booms and stormwater or backflow prevention devices. I, I failed to mention, we, we have probably one of the more advanced street sweeping initiatives in the city of St. Pete than other communities. And the reason other communities don't is because it's a very expensive operation. And people pay for that operation by their monthly stormwater bill. We have seven street sweepers mobilized that allow for two to three sweeps of every residential street per year. We sweep our downtown streets once a week and all our major arterials and collectors uh, twice a month. That keeps a lot of the debris from getting into your stormwater system. That is 14,000 tons per year that typically would, all, would, would or could get into your service. That's a very proactive way to get both litter and nutrients that come from your front guards and enter up the gutter line that run off into your storm system from getting into your bay water. So uh, we thank the people for proving the fact that this is a good expenditure of their dollars and we take advantage of managing that uh, by virtue of sweeping. We sweep the Howard Franklin, 
the Corbin Campbell, Sunshine Skyway, uh, Yandy, and every bridge from the Skyway to Tarpon, Tarpon Springs and back. The contracts with DOT. So not only are we, we, we do well with those contracts, by the way, we recover both our direct and indirect costs. So that tends to help help maintain the cost effectiveness of our local program. So Mike, you mentioned, uh, uh, I think you mentioned softball and beer being caught in these things. My, my pet peeve is, I'll, I'll use this for privilege, plastic bags. Do you find plastic bags caught in these traps? Well, by far and above, it's a big issue. Only because they get airborne so easily. And they're so light, and there's so many. I mean, it used to be the day when you could go out of the grocery store with three or four paper bags. Now you're exiting the grocery store with considerably more plastic bags. As a percentage, any guess as to what percent of the debris that you pick up, those tons that you pick up, are, are plastic bags? Well, from a ton standpoint, very little. From a biometric standpoint, considerably more, only because they're so light in nature. But they reside in the environment. I think a cigarette butt resides in the environment for 25 plus years. Now, when it's below water, it's a comparable amount of time. I think something like a plastic bag may reside below water or above for even a longer period of time. So, uh, it, although it's not a considerable tonnage, it's a considerable mass in, in terms of its volume. Do, do, do the lines to the, 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 uh, the storm drain? The, does the drainage system ever clog up because you've got so much volume of trash in there that you have to send somebody down below to unclog it? Yes, absolutely, and it happens all the time. Our most clogs happen after the leaves drop. As you can well imagine, it's not uncommon for this heavily vegetated canopy we have here in St. Petersburg, which has been caused for us to be a tree city USA for 25 straight years, uh, release a lot of leaves, and those leaves are many times not able to be collected by the property owner or by the city. There's a ton of trees on there, so right to put. They end up in the drainage system. Well, all you need is a couple of sticks that may cross a pipe 18 inches in diameter that gets a bunch of leaf pack behind it, and you have a storm, you have a clogged storm drain that requires one of these factors or other cleansing devices to remove the debris. You know, uh, when, when I have my lawn done, I don't really have a St. Augustine lawn, but I have people that come by and mow, and then they, they blow the debris into the street, and then the next rain is... is <laughs> I think I heard you mention it was his neighbor. I have neighbors that he can't I learned to have the world friend speaker. <laughs> so, okay, so what kind of damage am I doing to the bay when I... That's that's a terrible thing. For no other reason. <laughs> that, that's why the Tampa Bay water is considerably less cleansed than our water. <laughs> well, but in all seriousness, uh, the, the escort program that I referred to earlier helped pioneer local ordinances of which St. Pete was the first to adopt that prevented fertilizers to be utilized in the summer months. Fertilizers consist of nutrients that are promoting the growth of grass and other vegetative matter. And they're unnecessary. Uh, I always tell my neighbors, I mean, you can't grow grass in Florida without a bunch of fertilizer, then something's wrong. So uh, no fertilizing in the summer months, which is as measured from June through September. And there are other uh, Big box like Depot and uh, Lowe's are now authorizing iron and manganese as a substitute for that. So, absent that, if you're cutting your grass and letting it get in the, in the gutter and then it gets into the storm drain, attach to that grass to these nutrients that may be used by residents that are not abiding by the no nitrogen, no phosphorus fertilizer, especially in the summertime. That ends up getting into your bed. So, grass, although it can be a, a, a detritus that ends up organically contributing to the bay life, too much of it, just like leaves, can be a detriment to the bay's life. All right, good. I, and I'm never going to be that honest again. Uh, so we got, we got three questions. Let's go right here first. And can we really conclude that, well, let me say that, um, how can we conclude that education is actually working given that we're collecting so much trash by all these mechanical means? Do we have evidence that education 
Is working in the city of St. Pete to reduce littering? Yes, I, I think to a large degree, um, those that recreationally vote can testify to that. Uh, I, uh, I came from the Midwest, spent considerable years on the Great Lakes, and didn't realize how environmentally insensitive I was until I came down here. And I continue to learn from others that uh, you, you just can't put it into the bag. So I'd like to answer that question quantitatively based on the accumulation of debris that we continue to monitor and collect from our stormwater features. Uh, I think more so than, than anything else, it, it, it's a matter of how the bay's life has come back as measured by uh, grass planting which they are recovering it up. Well, that's, that's uh, runoff of nutrients. I'm talking about litter, educating the public about litter. And we have all these mechanisms in the city to collect it. But can you really demonstrate that, that an educational program that's reducing the amount of littering in the city is working? On a more micro standpoint than I started out with, I'd like to point uh, to the uh, clam by the drainage basin. Uh, Swift Bunk constructed a project on behalf of the city. The city deal was to acquire the real estate. And a regional stormwater treatment system was built down there. And it collects over a thousand, it collects and pre-treats over a thousand acres of urbanized and commercial runoff uh, as it migrates down and around uh, Twin Brooks Golf Course into that bio. And the city has undertaken the management of that by the operation and maintenance of that system. And we collect and monitor the tonnage of litter reaped from the pretreatment of that stormwater regional treatment system. And we also educate the public upstream that contribute to that. And we can report that we've had an improvement since that system went online. Just by virtue of spending $10 million and educating the public of the benefit that this expense brings to bear, we've shown a drop from when a project initially went online to today in the amount of litter that we extract with our maintenance crews. About a, about a year ago. Okay, next question right here. So I share your pet peeve of plastic bags, but that's my second pet peeve are plastic straws. Plastic straws. Mm -hmm. and you know, like there are cases when you're in the hospital, you're recovering from surgery, and you need a straw. But <laughs> most of the time, you don't. And every drink you get has a plastic straw in it. So uh, I just wanted to know if you had any uh, feeling about the percentage of plastic straws in the trash, and if that's another thing we can overregulate. No. <laughs> Algae bloom. I don't think people realize algae is 
uh, microscopic plant life, but when it dies off, it, it drops the water column of oxygen and can deplete it to the extent that it kills fish. Uh, so we, we think that uh, uh, a large algae, algae bloom caused that particular kill, which may have been similar to what you experienced. I believe I know where she may be talking about it. It's right behind, uh, it's at the top of the North Park and behind North Shore Pool. And that's I right. That it's, that it's, 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 it's always there. It's right there. The smell is always there. Yeah. Yeah. Could, could I ask, I mean, there may be an indigenous expert here. If you get further up to Coffee Pot Bayou, there are a few mangroves left. But I wonder if, if, if in that area, hundred years ago, were there mangroves and would you have smelled that smell? I mean, if there were more mangroves in that area, would, would that smell go away? Does anybody know the answer? Okay. Sorry. I can tell you that mangroves <coughs> trap debris more so than areas absent mangroves. You know, the root matter inherently functions as almost like a lake in a harboring and trapping debris. Let's go, uh, let's go there, and then we'll go there, and then we'll go there, and then we'll go there. Right. Okay, does your, you mentioned educational initiatives. Does your department have anything that you come out and give to elementary schools uh, that would be available? The most prominent feature that a lot of people remark upon is a plaque, and it says, don't dump here, drains the bay. And uh, we've used a number of different styles, but have deployed in excess of 20,000 such placards, and they are typically glued to the inlet basin that some of may decide to throw a plastic bottle into. But there's nothing for children that you have a movie that shows all this horrible debris that you're collecting? So um, our program, the Noah's Green Debris Program, we actually have a curriculum for K-12 students on our website and we have a number of, we have an activity book and a number of things that can be utilized for uh, K-12 programs. So um, talk to me afterwards and I can yes. give you our website. And also, Actually, it's new. the City of St. Petersburg Waste Management does offer field, free field trips. They even offer a bus that comes and picks up your kids and takes them to the facility so they can see the trash, see the recycling, see what's happening, and it's all free, and they have educational material on the website, and I know that I've taken my students, and it's a really good time. So it is out there. Tampa Bay Watch. Tampa Bay Watch. Yes. They have a wonderful opportunity for children to get involved volunteering, as well as summer camps and education. Okay. Sir, you talk about the, uh, the street sweeping here in St. Pete. Uh, what's being done in Tampa? Can you talk about how the street is used here? What, what about the Tampa in general? Uh, less frequent in terms of miles of street per year. Exactly. I, I know on, if you go on base or boulevards, and I understand that the whole tidal effect is in terms of the, the stench that can, can rise out of there sometimes, but the, the debris along that wall is just. It's almost embarrassing sometimes when tourists are here and they're out there walking along and you look over the wall and it just is amazing. Not what efforts are being made to clean that up? Well, we, we used to have an outfit called the Green Armada. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, they solicited sponsorships from corporate America to conduct the cleaning effort that you just suggested. And the city of St. Pete Tampa would sponsor the Armada to, to conduct that. And they relied on volunteerism to a large extent. Uh, their business plan didn't uh, endure to the extent where they ultimately had to migrate on. Uh, in all fairness, in Tampa, in the area you just mentioned, a lot has to do with the, the, ge the geographic layout of where the shoreline exists and how it may be an inherent trap, an inherent catcher's net of debris. And we don't have that type of a configuration that uh, Tampa suffers from by virtue of all the high tide heading up there and we get a south, southwest wind, which is our predominant wind direction and a sustained wind direction. And, and they're the target for where this debris might originate from, from on the Skyway Bridge and end up just where you spoke of. 
So we had a couple questions here. Oh, oh. I was going to ask you if the uh, St. Petersburg has many, many events. There are many trash containers, but very few are differentiated into a recycling side and a general trash. It seems to me that most of it goes into an undifferentiated waste stream. But I heard recently from someone that that's going to change and that St. Pete has a plan to, at least for public events, to put recycling bins adjacent to every trash container. What can you tell us about that? I can tell you that we need to get better at it. What, <laughs> what you've announced is an absolute truth. Uh, we have committed to getting better at it by virtue of being smarter in, in doing so. We recognize that uh, you need to differentiate the container for recyclables, much more than we've attempted to in the past. They have to have different openings in them. They have to have different looks to them. They have to have different nomenclature to spell out their purpose. Most of our attempts to recycle, uh, and we have over a thousand special events in the downtown area alone on an annual basis. Anything, anything from a red festival makes them. So uh, we've learned that our traditional ways of attempting to, to uh, recycle at these events are not working. We have a lot of contamination just over the course of the Grand Prix event, where we had separate containers for recyclables, we noticed that almost all of them had excessive contamination, estimated to be in excess of 30%. And I use that term not in the context of past waste, yeah. but in the context of where you should, a beer can should be, that ends up to be a, a, something different, a hamburger, I guess, or, or something even crazier. So, uh, admittedly, uh, we, we need to get better, smart about it, and I think we've established some goals and some objectives and some ideas to fulfill them. Uh, Mayor Kreisman is uh, very environmentally conscious, very green. He recognizes that not only does our universal curbside recycling initiative have to be implemented in the time in a cost-effective manner, so does our uh, use of the waterfront for our special events and recycling area. So, thank you. we, we got to get better. All right. Um, We, we like to think that the street sweeping effort addresses that to a large extent. Uh, the sweepers we do employ are, are water-based, so there's a water jet that's placed. They're roof sweepers. They have a vacuum device. So they, 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 they do wet the perimeter of, of their sweeping uh, radius and ultimately get it into a hopper that then is taken to our wastewater treatment facility. So most of the oils and greases that, that typically are encountered in the roadway not picked up by our street sweepers, do we need to get into the service part. So, you know, I, I think we only have a few more minutes left. Uh, Howard, how much time do we have to go on, on tonight's event? Well, we scheduled till 7.30. I want to make sure Robert has an opportunity. Yes, so do I. How long we haven't gotten to the recycling initiative that's on the table right now with the city, but... Is that a question, Howard? <laughs> Well, that, that is a really important question, but, but let, let's put Mike on hold for just a second. Yeah. Uh, so, so, Robert, let's, let's, talk about, uh, let's talk about turtles for a moment. Uh, what, do you, what do you do? But tell us uh, what, you're, uh, what you do for it academically and what, what do you do for work? Sure, sure. This is a, quite a switching of gears, but I really would like to start off by thanking the two panelists and their work. As you mentioned, like the local and broad scales that we're talking about here, it's really important that this forward is uh, it comes to light. And I work for the state sea turtle research program. I'm also a student at the College of Science that's you know, just down just down the road and on the water. And um, a lot of the research activities of our program with the, uh, with FWC are designed to uh, really give our that's our finger on the pulse of, of what's going on with turtles. Monitoring of nesting numbers, or if it's documenting stranding. And Ken mentioned the stranding network 
that is coordinated by NOAA, our agency, uh, throughout the, the U.S., uh, our agency coordinates Florida's component of that. And what that provides is, uh, oh, that's a really nice picture, of uh, a young sea turtle in Sargasso. But, so our, our stranding network really provides, I mentioned, our finger on the pulse of what's going on with sea turtles, especially what, what threats uh, are affecting them. And um, one of those things we've already mentioned tonight is on the fishing line. That's as far as what we see within the, the dead or injured turtles that are reported to us, uh, monofilament is the most common form, or one of the most common forms of anthropogenic debris that's, uh, that we document on the turtle. But anthropogenic? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know what it is, but. <laughs> yes, for sure. It's, it's, uh, that's one of the most common. Man, uh, man, man artificial, yeah. unnatural kinds of things that we see associated with turtles, stranded, sick, or injured, uh, dead turtles. Or, fishing line. But those strandings are, are animals that have washed ashore and have been reported to us. Maybe you've seen one as you're walking down the seawall, uh, or you've seen one on the beach, but it, it isn't a good measure of what's going on in the ocean, because as you know, the oceans are huge. And so part of our work is really focused on uh, going out to where these young turtles spend their early life stage, uh, out pretty far from shore amongst the sargassum, as this picture shows in these drift lines. So the same physical forces that are concentrating these, the sargassum seaweed that you see in the picture here are also concentrating any plastic or debris that's adrift. And these young turtles that are living in those environments for a year or, or several years, up to a decade, may, or they're, they're, we think that those are the most uh, affected by plastics in the ocean. So some of the things that we hear about, the big garbage patches and things like that, we think that these young turtles are really uh, where that's all uh, affecting the turtle population. What, what do the turtles think the plastic is, and what kind of plastics are, are, are most damaging? What, what are they most attracted to? Um, it just seems like anything. Uh, high, most of what ends up pretty far out to sea is highly weathered plastic debris that might have come from di different uh, shore sources, and maybe even uh, local sources. You know, something that might have been mentioned, stormwater uh, runoff, and uh, things on roads, intentional dumping ships or accidental dumping. Uh, but they, they pretty much, uh, these young turtles feed pretty indiscriminately and they eat just about anything. And if plastic looks as interesting as, as food. Would, would it be a hard, hard plastic, soft plastic? Yes. What, what are they most attractive? It's mostly, most of what's been found is plastic and tar. Um, pretty hard, persistent shards of plastic and tar. So are you doing the microscopies on the turtles? Yeah, so when they're, uh, everything that, uh, any of the animals that are reported through the stranding network that are in sufficient condition are examined uh, several times a year, the, the big, uh, the big party, so to speak, where all the animals are, all the dead parts are brought in, and, and they're examined for anything that can be found about them, like what caused them to die, what, what was their name, you know, what was the cause of death that we had. Often, a cause of death can't be determined, but uh, that's where we really are able to learn about So let's take some more questions. Huh? If each of you had one message to give to the greater community about what not to do to stop each of your problems, what would it be? So we're going to turn you guys from scientists into policy makers. I, I, I think um, education and awareness is it's got to be really important. And I would say, um, do what you can to tell people about it. Uh, maybe participate in a beach cleanup or something like that and, and join those kinds of efforts. Okay. I think one thing that we can all do that's really easy is just think about the consumable plastics that we use and think of reducing that use in our daily. Instead of going for the plastic bottle, get you know an analogy bottle and use that and refill it. Uh, and, and you know, there maybe there's no ban on plastic bags at your grocery store, but you can always bring a reusable, your own bag. So I think that's something that's fairly easy, and I think that you know those small things do make a difference. Don't walk down the street without picking up a piece of litter and putting it in a bucket.
So let's see. Uh, we're going to go back uh, to the back, and then we'll come over here, and then we'll come back here. So sir, in the back. I've been a fisherman all my life, and uh, I agree the amount of television is a huge problem. They have gun back buybacks in communities. If we give the fishermen an incentive, it doesn't help them, you know, it doesn't do a moral change to them, but it gives them an incentive, maybe a discount on a fishing license or something to buy fishing gear with or something to bring their monofilament in. Um, has that been done anywhere? I don't know. I can say, you know, one of the things that we're doing right now um, in Florida is working with a number of state agencies, so the DEP and the Florida Fish and Wildlife, to start to think creatively about particular strategies. And, and, and that was one that was brought up, is how do we incentivize this, you know, just the thought at this point. But, you know, I think that that's something that, you know, the means to where, if that's possible, is, you know, up beyond us, but in our room, that is something that we, we realize would be a useful strategy. So we'll see, hopefully. So we had a question over here. I had uh, two, two things to say. Um, back to what Mike said about um, don't leave, you know, don't, don't walk around with a piece of trash. Um, I work for NOAA and a couple of uh, colleagues of mine have just started a new initiative it's called Pay for Florida. I don't know if anybody, anybody's heard about it yet, but it just, they just started in the past few weeks. And it's basically, you are not supposed to leave the beach without picking up the trash. When you take a picture of the trash you um, had picked up and you're supposed to post it. And they actually just made the news and they had a post about it and they just started it in the past like, few weeks. Um, the other question I had was, I used to go to the Beacon for a while, and if you guys are all aware of, you know, downtown St. Pete, you're pretty well aware of all the new condos that are going up. I mean, there's quite a few right now. And when I went to the Beacon, we did not have any recycling, which hundreds of people, I mean, how many more people are going to be bringing in to the downtown area? So how are we going to be able to educate all of them? We're not going to provide recycling for the gigantic buildings and all these people. We should at least be able to educate them on, you know, where are their areas that they can bring the recycling um, if we're not actually going to pick it up for them. And if we're going to bring all these people in here, what are we going to do about the trash? Like all, I mean, how many buildings are being built right now that are gone? Uh, Non-residential recycling is the subject matter and it is a cooperative effort between the city and the given facility. We know of 200 <coughs> plus apartment buildings already that we cooperate with and provide the factors and or uh, private sector haulers to collect the recyclables. Uh, that really is an emphasis that needs to take place from the grassroots of the place you're living at to begin with. Condo associations do it, apartment complexes are doing it, and a fair amount of them in the downtown area have begun or are doing it. So it emanates from there, uh, can be collaborated with our city sanitation department, uh, but you're absolutely right. That's probably the most cost effective way to recycle is in your multifamily establishments. You have 200 plus dwelling units contributing to a handful of receptacles versus the residential units that require a fleet of trucks to pick up a couple of so that's really a matter of calling our sanitation department and getting something going in terms of connecting with the proper dumpsters that we would provide, uh, the vendors that will collect it, if not the city itself, as complemented by drop-off sites. We have 18 different recycling drop-off sites located throughout the city that can be accessed off of the city's website in terms of their precise locations. And they take their traditional uh, Receptacle, your traditional recyclables, your fibers involving cardboard and newspaper and magazines, uh, aluminum, steel cans, uh, and plastics. So you have to drop up, and, and then a lot. There's a lot of not-for-profits. There's over 120 different not-for-profits that would love your recyclables, and you can help out those that need it the most while disposing of it at the closest one. And those are also available on the city website so inclined to collaborate with an entity that can make money from recycling the goods that you may bring. But generally speaking, your agency, your uh, managerial company needs to get 
in touch with our sanitation department to watch that happen. Well, I, I don't want that anymore, but I just say it because I believe in my house and I realize how much I recycle now is wonderful, but I mean, I, when I lived in the building, I wasn't really aware of where to bring everything, so how do we get it out to people like who needs to specialize? And the city government will work with the managerial company in charge of a condo association or a parking complex. But let me just say quickly introduce C.J. Reynolds, who's with the International Ocean Institute, who's doing a project to raise consciousness about the amount of trash that we generate. Uh, C.J., just tell us real quickly about your project. We certainly appreciate all the interesting uh, information that the speakers have brought forward. Uh, it was about uh, nine months ago where a group at the College of Marine Science really recognized and the need for additional uh, community collaboration on uh, marine debris issues, particularly looking at uh, the land-based uh, plastics and things that we can do um, from you know, cleanup initiatives to further youth education and empowerment or collaboration with existing organizations that already have really, really good networks well established. And, um, so we've created a program that will be uh, launching later this fall called Clean Community, Clean Coast, of which the uh, sort of exciting cornerstone um, launch of this and, and working with scientists, we sort of recognized we needed some creative help in uh, engaging the citizens. So we have created a collaboration with a group of artists uh, to build a large uh, sculpture made from reclaimed plastics and marine debris as a part of a, a coastal cleanup that will be featured at the St. Petersburg Science Festival, which will really launch a lot of the education for the youth and the community, which is also part of the Marine Quest uh, that the, uh, our, our you know, ocean and science agencies have. So that's one of the things. And there's ways for people who want to get involved from uh, the art making as well as coastal cleanups. Uh, uh, like for uh, Bill Sanders, who's the executive director for Keep Pinellas Beautiful, which is a, a collaborator. Bill can stand up or wave. He's in the back of the room. And he has provided us with trash that has been a part of the coastal cleanups in the community, which is really interesting. That's a sociological study there to see what kind of trash has come in. And there's a lot to learn about and a lot for our communities to learn about what is not trash and what is good trash, as well as uh, youth organizations such as uh, Girls Incorporated and also with the City of St. Petersburg uh, Tasco Team Digital Technology Center. So we'll be working on a lot of this. But um, wanted to just show you the picture of the sculpture uh, that is the uh, model in the back. It's going to be 30 feet high by 40 feet. And it's really intended to demonstrate uh, what we cannot see, sort of, sort of the gyre, the Pacific swirling plastic debris. So people will be able to walk underneath that and really experience plastic swirling over their head. Uh, as well as we have artists from Georgia State who will be using and working with a number of the uh, art organizations such as the Florida Craftsman Gallery. We appreciate the support that DALI has given us as a part of hosting community education workshops. And there'll be collaborations also with the Fine Arts Museum uh, and, and some additional artistic um, uh, engagements with the Blue Ocean Film Festival. So this fall will really be the beginning of the launch of an ongoing effort. And we know there's many organizations that are already really doing phenomenal things and have great information we'd like to invite you to sign up on the uh, sheet, put your name down. You can also, if you'd like to receive information from NOAA, the Green Debris, the newsletter, Coastal Cleanups, and we will um, send your information to the appropriate people. So thank you for that opportunity. and. Um, and all for the work you guys are all doing and your interest in this topic. Thank you. So, I think we have time for just a few more questions. Uh, you've had your hand up for a while. Uh, Jay, you've had your hand up for a while. Go ahead. Uh, I have a question for um, Mike and uh, then the other two. Is there any statutes about um, throwing out trash, you know, on the highways or in your neighborhood? Please, the law enforcement to do. And then also, these two, um, when our trash goes out to sea, it goes to probably a, a jar of plastic. And I was wondering which is the closest jar of plastic. Is it the Sargasso Sea? And how many uh, miles is this, this uh, amount of ocean? And how many jars of plastic are there out in the, uh, the oceans as well? I'll stick with the micro aspect there on local law on the books. That's yeah. prohibited littering from the city code standpoint, from a state law standpoint, in particular on the DOT highway. So that's uh, uh, really not a matter of violating the law as much as it is enforcing that law. And our uh, office.
officers uh, obviously have a, a big challenge to uh, prevent crime in the city and, and typically enforcing litter laws is not uh, a part of their list. So, uh, in terms of the other question, I'll take it. Well, that one's uh, a good question. The, the Pacific is known mostly for the, the gyre, and um, a lot of there's some misconceptions about what is a, a garbage patch, and, and and actually it's more a concentration of these what um, Rob was saying. I'm sorry. So Rob was saying, you know, that he sees out in these surfaces and catches these weathered pieces of plastic, and that's um, often what happens with consumer debris on beaches is they never completely degrade. They just get smaller and smaller and smaller and turn into what we call microplastics. And so in the, um, wherever you have a circulation pattern that can concentrate sargassum, um, which is a seaweed, that natural substance, it can also concentrate um, these plastics. So um, I'm not sure how many of those are because I think that there are pretty numerous areas where where we have eddies, and I'm sure they change depending on the season. Um, there's there are some that are that are larger than others and are more well known than others. But um, um, yeah, there's in the Gulf of Mexico. I think there's room for more research on that actually, and um, I'm hoping that eventually we'll see some more research on kind of concentration areas in, in the in the Gulf. <laughs> My concern, I was born and raised in Tampa, and we have a body of water here. We have Tampa, Clearwater, and St. Pete, and St. Pete is doing all these wonderful things. And if the rest of our neighbors or Tampa isn't joining in in this effort, then we're still going to be impacting our bodies of water. So, you know, what do we do? I know the Marine Science Institute, you know, is over here. Every year there's just more water over here than in Tampa, well, not really. But, um, you know, what do we do? I, it really concerns me. I know, you know, we had clean water and it got really bad and it's now it's a lot better. But it seems like it has a lot to do with what St. Pete has done. Maybe more than Tampa. I mean, you can take it too. I'm shaking your head. That's yeah, so. clearly part of the problem. <laughs> the, uh, it's a difficult question to kind of speak on behalf of other government officials, but there's no question it's a level of conscientiousness and a level of land use. Uh, Tampa is much more of an industrial based community than St. Petersburg. We're, we're essentially a bedroom community here with a fair amount of commercialism to address our primary issue called tourism. Inherent with tourism is environmental conscientiousness and desire to protect and preserve something. Uh, Tampa has to cater to a lot of different land uses uh, than St. Petersburg was. And, and, uh, coming from the Great Lakes region where Tula and I and Steel and Auto were king, I can tell you that that tax base had a larger voice than the tourism tax base, not to say here in St. Petersburg. So the different tax bases and the influence that they bring to bear in solving the problem that they would make contribute to is a, is a differentiation. Uh, funding source. St. Petersburg implemented a stormwater utility in the early 90s. That was a dedicated funding source that allowed for the ongoing management, maintenance, and capitalization of the system as it relates to building bigger pipes to reduce flooding and to constructing and, and maintaining stormwater pretreatment systems to improve the water quality. Uh, Pinellas County just adopted a stormwater utility with a dedicated revenue source. And you're going to see their improvements uh, follow St. Petersburg uh, generation of improvements. And Tampa uh, needs to, uh, has a utility in place but has a very modest monthly fee. And I think it's a, a necessary uh, requirement for them to better educate their, their constituency on how that money can be well spent to improve their environment. So it's funding, it's interest, it's land use, and it's competing interest to a larger extent. So hopefully that kind of capsulizes as, as I see it. Thank you. Thank you.
You know, and next year we're going to ask Howard to do a poly side cafe. And we're going to invite Mayor Buckhorn and the Hillsborough County Commission. Yeah. So what do you think, Howard? Right. Okay. So how about maybe two more questions, uh, right here?
that's, that's downstream of us. And what's downstream, we know we've learned a lot in the last few years of what's going on in the Gulf about the loop current and how dynamic it is, the Florida current, things going on and attempting out into the Atlantic Ocean and, and uh, the big gyres there. That, um, and, and so these plastics aren't just affecting turtles, they're affecting seabirds, they're affecting fisheries, and some of those fisheries are commercially important. So, um, Maybe in the context of, of tonight and tonight's topic, I, I think turtles are important, uh, but they're just one of one of the members of the ecosystem. That's really important. So they're visual. They're canary. I guess they they could be. Um, yeah, they're, they're they're one of the members of a really important ecosystem to humans. I think. <coughs> seabirds, sea turtles, or the big flat fish as well. Uh, they're all out there. They're all in this connected. Well, on that note, uh, Robert, Michael, thank you, thank you very much.